So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this program on understanding hoarding disorder. We are joined today by Tamar Cooper, who is the Director of Behavioral Health Services at the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. We have a lot of folks joining us for this webinar today, so it's clearly an important topic, and we're very glad to have you all here. Uh, since it is a large group, we are going to wait until the last 15 or 10 minutes of this webinar for questions. Uh, these slides will be made available to you uh, in an email following the presentation, and the webinar will also be posted to the NAMI Greater Cleveland YouTube channel later in the week. Um, please remain muted during the presentation, and please also utilize the chat feature if you have questions, and again, we will take time at the end to address those. Um, for many of you, you're probably familiar with our organization, NAMI Greater Cleveland. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and our mission is dedicated to improving quality of life for individuals living with mental illness and their families, and we do that by providing education, support, information and referral and advocacy. And today's program is an example of the community and clinical education that we are very happy to provide for you on a monthly basis and which highlights and feature uh, clinical experts on with um, expertise on special topics pertaining to um, mental health and community resources. And that will be what today is all about um, in the area of hoarding disorder. So with that being said, I will hand it over to Tamar to begin our presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tam Cooper. Uh, again, as Matt said, I'm the Director of Behavioral Health Services at Benjamin Rose. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak this afternoon on the topic of hoarding. So um, if you will, bear with me. I want to give you a just a little background on uh, Benjamin Rose. So next slide, Matt, please. Okay, so at Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging, our goal really is to help older adults maintain their independence to continue living in their homes or in the environment most comfortable to them. We have more than 30 years of experience providing behavioral health services and advocating on behalf of older adults and their caregivers. Uh, we accept a variety of payment options, uh, approved insurance, and I think one important thing is that uh, if you're interested, you can call our intake department, 216-791-8000. You can certainly email us at intake at benrose.org, or you can contact me, Tamar Cooper, uh, 373 1784, or my email is tcooper at benrose.org. Next slide, please. So what are some of the characteristics of hoarding? Well, hoarding is characterized by a tendency to hold on to a large quantity of material items. Now, as we go through this presentation, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the difference between hoarding, cluttering, and collecting. So hoarding is only considered if it's not better explained by depression, anxiety, social phobias, or obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, I'm sure there's a mixed audience out there. Some of you may be loved ones of people who are experiencing this, know someone, you may be professionals who work with people who have this disorder. Um, or you yourself may be struggling with this. So I uh, hope that as we go through these different slides and explanations that you might hear something that you find useful. So again, another characteristic of hoarding is, uh, boy, if you ask someone who struggles with hoarding to part with their belongings, it can create significant feelings of distress in them. If you've ever asked someone who has um, a bunch of things in their home who you might consider to be a hoarder to say, hey, why don't you get rid of that uh, pile of old magazines you've had sitting over there? Their reaction can be anything from, I'm not gonna get rid of that, I might need it someday, or to even someone who you know just breaks down in tears. You know, It's a really 
significant feeling of distress that they show. And some common examples of hoarded materials are newspapers, books, clothes, cleaning supplies, food, junk mail, and of course, animals. Next slide. Some other uh, characteristics uh, that you might see are strong urges to save, uh, people who feel safer with material objects than with people. Um, oftentimes you may see uh, that someone with this disorder, you know, they may be functioning very well out in the community, uh, have a job, uh, doing well, uh, but then you open the door. Or sometimes we say, you know, you scratch the surface, you walk in and their home is in great, dis great disarray. They've surrounded themselves almost like a cocoon with these different things that they've hoard. A feeling of safety. They just feel more comfortable with that than with people. Difficulties with discarding. Uh, just unable to let go of that uh, piece of clothing, that uh, piece of paper that they've been hanging on to that's yellowed and torn up or a receipt that they've had for 20 years. Procrastination, disorganization, and avoidance are big red flags for people. Um, and this isn't like with the, some of us have seen with teenagers, clean your room, oh, I'll do it later, you know, or they're, you know, I, I'm not ready to do it, or this, you know, being disorganized. This is something to such a level that it is negatively impacting their life, their safety, their health, their welfare and high levels of resistance to requests or demands, of course, to discard belongings. Next slide. So I really kind of like this slide that shows hoarding versus collecting versus cluttering. Collecting. Here's a nice picture of collecting. Somebody here is collecting radios. You know. When our social workers go to work with somebody uh, that's hoarding, or perhaps you've encountered someone that has a bunch of stuff in their home, and they say, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm a collector. I'm collecting these dolls, or I'm collecting these books, and they're all over the place." Well, you know, if you're collecting something, it's not you're not going to have that precious item laying on the floor, you know, buried under a pile of stuff, right? You're going to have it organized sitting up on a shelf where it's protected, just like in this picture. Clutter. You know, uh, probably a number of us have some parts of our home or garage where there's some clutter. Maybe, perhaps not to this extent, but I know I can speak for myself. I've got some different areas, even in my office, that are somewhat cluttered. Uh, uh, some different boxes, some papers. Then you go down to hoarding. Piles upon piles. Who knows what's under there? But I bet if you talk to somebody who was hoarding, as our therapists sometimes do, they'll say, oh yeah, I know that way buried underneath this box and this gray coat is a, uh, there's a hat that is a collector's item that I know someday I'll be able to sell. Next slide. Hoarding owns the hoarder. I really like that statement because to me, it's almost like uh, an addiction. Uh, an alcoholic, uh, you can't make that decision to put down the alcohol or the drug. You are driven by this. Hoarding owns the hoarder. The owner of excessive items is unable to sever the tie with the object he or she collects. Cluttering, it may be a marker of a hoarding disorder, but an individual can accumulate numerous somewhat related objects for several reasons. Um, 
you know, I can pick up some things here or there. Um, but if I'm walking through a thrift store or, or I've got different papers, I don't, I'm not consumed or driven to have everything. Collecting is an organized displays of items that are appreciated by the collector and they're precious items that are set someplace um, and they may serve as a recreational hobby. I don't have to have each and every item and it's not driving me to use my last penny and uh, forsake my safety and welfare or ruin my relationships to have. Next item, or I mean, <laughs> next item, next slide. Hoarding versus organized chaos. Sometimes I like to say that my office is organized chaos. I don't know if that's such a good idea, but some of you might be able to relate. So hoarding is gathering and then keeping unnecessary items. I wonder if many of you may know someone who has that. They just have to have that, um, that old piece of something that they see on the side of the road because they just might need that someday, you know? And, and you're wondering, well, why do you need another uh, empty Walmart bag or another empty milk can? Well, you know what? To the person who was doing the hoarding, they just might need that. Someone with organized chaos, it's functionally disorganized, but you're not necessarily attached to the items. Uh, I might pick up another red folder, but I could probably pitch it later on, you know, when I'm looking at it. And it won't take me years or months. There is extreme panic when a person is asked to discard an item in, who has a hoarding disorder. Someone with organized chaos, no, it's, it's not a big deal to pitch that item, whether it's a um, folder or a table or you know and maybe it's a different kind of a perfume or makeup and a hoarding situation the space in the home is obstructed with a collection of items and it's created a safety hazard some of you perhaps have seen the television show what hoarders um, and it creates a safety hazard in my opinion, in my opinion only, I think that the show uh, can highlight some important parts about hoarding disorder, but I also believe that it can create some difficulties for people and the person with hoarding that in 60 minutes, you cannot resolve this disorder. And we will talk about this later uh, because it takes a lot longer than 60 minutes to go in and help someone. And there are no teams, at least here in Cuyahoga County, that will go in without a cost and clean up a space uh, and, and, and fix something like that. Organized chaos, there's minimal of obstruction in a home there's things aren't piled up to the ceiling the you're not going to have um building department come in and cite you and you can easily get in and out of the residence and finally in hoarding there's an issue with some cognitive disorganization uh, trouble with memory and problem solving. You know, there's there's that inability to understand. Well, how is me collecting, collecting, and and keeping all these things? Why should that be a problem to my loved one or the kids or whose business is it? If I have my house packed with all these different things, they can't seem to see how that can create an issue. Uh, when everybody else around them can, you know, um, but someone who has like organized chaos is, you know, it's not a cognitive de deficit because it's not reached that high level enough where it's caused problems. Next slide. 
The onset of hoarding symptoms we initially reported as beginning in midlife, but research has found that it, uh, to begin in childhood or adolescence. And there's also research that shows that it may be related to some early childhood trauma. Compulsing, compulsive hoarding severity increases with each decade of life. Now, not surprisingly enough, the majority of clients have never received treatment for hoarding. And while I say not surprisingly, it's because we no longer have this nuclear family. And, you know, uh, if you're living alone and you're socially impaired, who's going to know that your house is all full of all kinds of stuff or falling apart? And the one thing I would like to share with all those that are listening is I, uh, as a social worker, would like to say, please stick your nose in your neighbor's business. Walk over uh, to your neighbor's house, say hi, leave them a note, bring them over some cookies, even if they're a grumpy old person, because you never know what simple act of kindness might uh, save a life, might mean something. So many people are living alone and isolated. Next slide. Uh, people hoard all different kinds of things. Um, because so many people are living alone and families have moved apart, moved away, or as we grow older, we've lost friends, family members. We often turn to animals as a substitute. And the sad part is someone who does uh, accumulate animals, they can't see that there, it's a detriment to that animal. And our workers here, it's, it's really sad because you see, as some of you have seen on a television show, you have a lot of animals in there. <laughs> and they're hurting and they're sick. So it's a failure to provide minimal standards of sanitation, space, nutrition, okay? Inability to recognize the effects of this failure on the welfare of the animals. So that person who has all these animals just can't see that they're hurting the animal. They continue, you know, the animal welfare will come in and take the animals out. And that person will go in and get more animals. Denial or minimization of the problems and living conditions uh, of the animals. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you have seen, it was a documentary called Gray Gardens, um, rich family that was a, related to the Kennedys. They, had, uh, they couldn't understand why the raccoons and the opossums were coming in. Well, one lady was feeding the raccoons and the opossums. And, and, Animals can be anything we've had here at Benjamin Rose. It's not cats and dogs. Somebody had some flying monkeys, birds, you name it, people have them. So that's animal hoarding. Next slide. So here's an overlap of some of these hoarding disorders, which is just interesting. People with OCD or compulsive hoarders, the animals might be at risk people who live with companion animals. And this, it breaks your heart to see this because a piece of you uh, can see why someone who's alone wants an animal, you know, because that's the only contact. But then when you see the distress that the animal is in, it's, it's very rough. And I deal with that when I work with my team, the therapists that come in and, you know, what do you do when you're torn between saving the animals and the hurt and pain that the person is in? So next slide. Now, the person that does the hoarding sees, of course, some benefit to it. 
you know, when they put things in a pile, then they don't have to decide about what to save or how to organize. It's just, you know, put off, what is it? Put off tomorrow, what you can't do today or something, you know, you, you just avoid it. You avoid that emotional pain and discomfort that would come with discarding the item. And it's, it's really not the item. It might be what that attachment is, whether it's from the past trauma, what it means. Sometimes when we're doing that, it's we're focusing on collect or while well, we're focusing on holding on to all these items because then we don't have to deal with the chaos of our life or the sorrow of our own life. And acquiring something new enables a person to avoid absolutely dealing with the unpleasantness and feelings. Now it can cause euphoria or it just could cause dumbness. Very good, next slide, please. So here's some examples. Ooh, look at that refrigerator. Yep, next slide books, stuff, but I can guarantee somebody in this place had had this picture. And some of these, we have references from where these slides were taken. Somebody's gonna say way down there, buried underneath it is some really important document or something really valuable <laughs> that they don't wanna get rid of. Next slide. So, what can you do or what can you know about this? Well, again, like I said, that it's not 60 minutes to solve this one time and, you know, somebody's going to pay to take care of this. Person who is doing this hoarding is going to, re it's going to take a long time to resolve, resolve if ever this situation. And it's going to be periodic intervention. There's going to be uh, periods of relapse, if you will, two steps forward, one step back, uh, listen without judgment, uh, and that there are, will be real consequences for this person and that you may have to step back. Somebody may not want to clean up and it's for you, the loved one or the neighbor or whatever, that if that person does not want to take the necessary steps, they may lose their home. They may wind up getting really physically ill because of what's happened in that house. They may go to housing court. Um, they may have to go to a shelter and you can't fix that for them. Only they have to have the desire. You can't think it's important. And when I say you, I mean just the collective of us. Um, we get calls here that say, oh, my mom or my neighbor, or this, they, their house is all messed up. I've got to get them to do it. I've yelled and screamed and yelled. What, what can I do? Unless it's voluntary, you can't do anything. But what you can do, and we'll talk about that later, is you need help for you. It's kind of like, I know a lot about addictions and things. Al-Anon, if we don't take care of ourselves as a caretaker, we're not going to be use for use of anything. So getting therapy for ourselves uh, is the support that we can get. And also being prepared and knowing about available community resources, which is what we can talk about. And which again is something that you can offer and just let that person know what's available. Next slide. What doesn't work? Trying to intervene alone uh, and expecting that a one-time clean out will solve the problem. I guarantee <laughs> if you think that uh, Uncle uh, Jacob is like gonna be out of the house, you know, he's gonna be out uh, collecting stuff on the street and you and your brother and sister are gonna go in and clean that house out and it's gonna be good. He's gonna come back in hotter than a hornet and he will fill that house back up in no time. Um, being dramatic, criticizing or nagging that person. 
It's only going to make a bigger wedge. Uh, a surprise clean out, not going to work. Because until that person comes to terms with what the underlying issue is, with why they are engaging in this activity, it's not going to happen. And that's why it's really great to work with therapists to social workers that understand what the trauma is, what the symptoms is, what the reasons are uh, that can attempt to address this with not only the family members or loved ones, but the person who's actually involved in it, um, that have a willingness to want to do it. That's, that's what's really key. Um, Again, I, I, I talk a lot about addiction because I have a specialty in it. An alcoholic isn't going to quit drinking because you force them to. You know, you can, you know, I, I tell when I talk to people about that, I say, you got a back problem. You got the courts on your back. You got your wife on your back. You want to get rid of that back problem? Then this is what you need to do. Okay, so you you got the courts on your back because you got an eviction notice. You got you know, housing court on you, you know, are you ready to work on this back problem? You know, because you can't lie, fake any of this stuff. The house isn't cleaned up and you, you know, want to sustain it. You have to do the work and you have to really understand this to heal. Uh, so, you know, you can exaggerate the consequences. They, people don't care unless you really want to solve this. And if you only treat the symptoms, which is the mess, that's you're just putting a cover on that wound and it's going to fester underneath. You've got to get at the heart of the matter. Next slide, please. And so if you know a person who is buried in treasures, and that's in quotes because I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Do not touch or remove any item without explicit permission or clean out the house while they are gone. Uh, that person will go ballistic. <laughs> and you may not think that they don't know that one piece of paper that's in that big old pile, but they do. And it also may be the one piece of paper that's important to them. Uh, that person should make the all the decisions about the possessions. And that's why it's important that you work, someone works hand in hand with the person who has the hoarding to make the decisions. And that's why it truly is a process to work on cleaning out the hoard, if you will. And the person should only be allowed to handle that piece of paper that ant, well, would be the animal, that book, whatever, one time or at least twice. If you handle it more than, if you let them handle that more than twice, they want it. They want to hang on to it. Always remember, this is not your fault. In a lot of ways, it's not their fault. You know, it's just like a mental illness. It's nobody's fault, you know, and there is help available. Uh, I feel very, Proud and lucky to say, you know, I've been at Benjamin Rose for 13 years, and we just have a wonderful agency that helps people, older adults, 55 and over, with a variety of issues. And our behavioral health services works with people who have a lot of issues with trauma and, uh, Hoarding is one area, but uh, again, the person has to be willing. You can't force someone. I think what's even more important, what I've been seeing is it's the family member, it's the loved one who we get a lot of calls from that are reaching out to say, what can I do? Um, because again, if that person, a lot, you know, you can't force someone to do something. So calling up and 
seeing about getting some treatment. I, I call it treatment for yourself is significant. Now, there's also uh, an organization it's called the Hoarding Connection of Cuyahoga County, which is uh, a part of what we belong to. And the Hoarding Connection is administered by, again, Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging and receives funding from the Alcohol, Drug Addiction and Mental Health Services, the Adams Board of Cuyahoga County, which is really just such a wonderful board that supports a lot of the agencies. I think NAMI, you, you all get money from uh, the Adamus board. And the uh, hoarding connection helps, uh, meets like once a month and talks about different issues and sponsors a conference once a year. And that's what they've been doing so far to provide education to the community and professionals about different issues on hoarding. If you look at their website, uh, www.hoardingconnectioncc.org, you will find uh, a list of some businesses that offer services, services for a fee to help do cleaning or different issues, different services for people who do hoarding. But what I want to, and I hate to say the word stress because people are desperate when they call us. And again, with the television show, it makes it sound like we, we, we do get a lot of calls. When is you, when will your team come out to the home to, you know, come out clean, shovel out. And, and I heard Benjamin Rose has money to, you know, cl you know, clean the house out and this and that we don't, we don't have that. And I don't think anybody in Cuyahoga County has that. And again, that really wouldn't, even if we did, it wouldn't solve the problem because unless you get to the heart of the matter, somebody's going to hoard things up again. So I just want to just reiterate that. Uh, is there another slide? Because I think we're reaching pretty soon to, oh, okay. Behavioral Health Services of Benjamin Rose. Just a quickie plug for us that because we don't only just work with people who have hoarding issues we do mental health case management we do a hybrid service where we do telehealth we talk to people on the phone we can go out to some homes where we make a lot of connections to psychiatric and medical care housing and other entitlements specific to individuals needs counseling one-on-one -on -one talk therapies with licensed social workers to provide support, trauma-informed treatment, which I think is just so important these days. We uh, work with people who have been victimized by cyber romance scams, and that has been on the rise. Uh, that's uh, another one of my issues that just makes me sad because people live alone and older adults have been taken advantage of uh, so much with that um people you know covid changed us didn't it <laughs> you now we became even more isolated and it's post post covid world um we have therapists who's trained in emdr and the treatment that integrates breathing and coping techniques to manage anxiety and trauma related issues and a really good strong program that we have is um, it's called a mental health day treatment but it's not all day it's a three-hour group therapy program it's in the morning and then we have started to offer one on thursday afternoons it's for it's here it's offered here on our main campus site here on uh, fairhill road it's for people that have severe mental illness and uh, please don't let severe mental illness uh, change your way of thinking. Uh, if you have anxiety, depression, uh, bipolar, and you can sit in a group or, and we do this by phone too, uh, and, and you can function in a group. It's great. It was kind of halfway designed between group members and the therapists. You get an opportunity to talk about grief and loss and uh, how you're managing with 
your illness in today's world. And it's run by three, except in my opinion, three exceptional therapists who have a great opportunity to work with people. So that's our mental health day treatment program. So with the support and counseling from this team, they, you're empowered to manage your mental and emotional problems. And one of the best things about Benjamin Rose is it's not just the behavioral health services, it's all the services that this institute has. And we've been around for a long time. And it, Matt, if you switch to the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about our subsidiaries. Um, ESOP, which is empowering and strengthening Ohio's people. They do financial and housing issues for uh, older adults here in Cuyahoga County. And they've won a number of awards and been recognized by a lot of people and they do a lot. Rose Centers for Aging Well, they've got, I'm probably wrong, I wanna say seven, but they have senior centers across Cuyahoga County. Uh, there's meals, uh, bingos things one of my big things that they do I love they call it a senior prom it's coming up in June where it's for the older adults get to come and they um I call it a big throwdown because I was in the south for a while and then older people get all dressed up and they have a dance and it's it's just a, a great thing Margaret Wagner apartment apartments on Euclid Heights Boulevard if you all remember Dorothy Fuldheim I know I can't hear any of you, but Dorothy Fuldheim was there. She was a female reporter many years ago, senior housing. Our agency was a recipient of a funding and an award just that we worked really hard to get and it's expanding. Wonderful uh, apartment, uh, uh, that does a lot is expanding and then there's a center for research and education and then a number of programs uh, we care because you do that works with caregivers um, just a lot of great things for seniors so i think that's it except that i wanted to mention on another slide of course we have our readings references that if any of you are interested in having any speakers talk on mental health topics could reach out to either myself or Kirsten Yoder, K Yoder at benrose.org. We're happy to do any presentations on a variety of mental health subjects, uh, mental health 101, anxiety, and such. So I am open to any questions and I guess if there's some I'm not always the best at the how this highfalutin technology goes but Matt could help me if there's some things here in the chat room and if I can answer I'd love to if I have to turn my I I know I'm not on mute here so Matt can you help Okay. I'm just asking you to, I'm prompting you to start your video again so we can see you. Okay. There you go. All right. So thanks so much, Tam, for this presentation. Um, we've got a full, we've got a packed room of 100 people today. Wonderful. Um, so um, sorry to any folks who may have been kicked out or been unable to um join because of the limit of 100 attendees on our current Zoom license. But again, we'll make sure these slides and the recording are made available to all of you um, afterwards. So um, we are open. We have a lot, we have a lot of time for questions. Um, I did receive one question in the chat already, um, which is, uh, did COVID magnify or um, exacerbate hoarding disorders? Do you have any thoughts or observations on that? I'll give you my opinion. I think lots of times we we as a society like to say that a certain situation magnified something. Uh, I, I want to say no, uh, because, well, I take that back. 
you know, the seniors always ha were able to access going to a, having people come into their homes like social workers or the Meals on Wheels people could at least poke their head in the room. You know, when COVID happened, people weren't able to get into their to people's homes. Those that would visit couldn't get in. So it probably did because people couldn't see exactly what was going into a home. But on the other hand, I also like to say that did things get exacerbated by it? I, I sometimes think we're in a society where we turn our heads, don't we? Old, older adults, we get cast aside. And I, and that's a sad part. And that's why I like working with older adults. Is you have an obligation to people. And I don't think, my opinion, I don't think we care so much about one another as we should, old, young, or whatever. And that's me as a social worker. Thank you. Uh, I have another question here. Um, knowing that some individuals, as your presentation highlighted, may hoard papers, magazines, uh, junk mail, documentation. Um, do you have any thoughts on what is an easy, low stress way to handle decisions about what to keep regarding papers and uh, documentation? Well, that. <laughs> You know, that's a generational thing. I'm dealing with, uh, I'm 65. I have a brother that's 72. We learned from our family. My mom did the check checkbook and she would write each thing, the check number, the confirm, confirmation number, blah, blah, blah. I do stuff on the computer. My brother is writing all this stuff out. I don't know why. And we're saying, why don't you do it the easier way? Uh, you know, there's receipts and tax documents you want to keep. What's the easier way? You know, it's you learn by example. I so I I don't know. I mean, there's Maybe a document that you need to keep. I don't or investing in a shredder so that you can just oh that it. yeah if you're talking about that shredders i see now they have this thing on um, i live in the country you know what i do i burn papers now you all live in the city i don't think you're allowed to burn stuff <laughs> i guess a shredder would be good they have shredding events uh the scam squad is having some kind of shredding event coming up um check that out uh I, I, from the perspective of someone who hoards, they're not going to get rid of anything. So if that's how the question was, that's what I would say. Be careful. Whatever you do, when you go to throw something out, though, cross out your, get a black marker and cross out your name on prescription bottles, anything, because someone will get a hold of that. Then you got to call the scam squad is real. The, the Consumer Affairs Department, extremely useful. I have a question. Yes. Um, about the hoarding, the you know, papers and mail, junk mail and stuff like that. I, I do have some, someone that, that does that, that holds each and every paper. Doesn't matter if it's, you know, advertising that it will come <laughs> back next week. She says it's important. If anything has to do with something that she thinks is important, she doesn't want to just throw it out. And I try to explain to her that this is just advertising. It will come back again to you in a couple of weeks. They'll keep on advertising it. But she just considers just to hold on to it. Um, even though I cross out her other mail with some... Um, is it like a black uh, marker that you yeah. can erase the, the, the address and everything because she's scared of that, but she just keep on continually holding on to these this junk mail and, and it's like I have to go there every week and, and tell her to like maybe uh, give me a bag of mail and I'll shred it. Well, um, you're but, lucky that she lets you shred it. It's frustrating. I... You're, 
I guess consider yourself lucky, but <laughs> you may want to ask her what's going to happen when you don't go there anymore. Or another thing you could say, put this, you know, reframe it. What would you do so and so if it was me? If mm -hmm. and I had all this stuff, how could you keep me safe? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Uh, I have another question um, from someone who says, I work for a court and have usually um, building departments involved with rundown houses and or hoarding inside or outside of the house. I have referred to the Buried and Treasures group in the past, but it seems like they just opened back up. Is individual counseling a better approach or both in addressing some of the hoarding behavior? I There's the BITS group did just open up. It's a voluntary uh, program. It's, I think that, you know, there's different options for different people. I think the best thing would be for the person who's called from the courts to call our intake department at 791-8000 and ask to speak to, well, it's 791-8000, ask to speak to someone in intake in behavioral health, because it's all individualized for the person and see what would be a best option. I put the number for the Benjamin Rose intake in the chat, and they also put a link to the um, scam squad also in the chat. And there's a, yeah, scam squad will hook you up with consumer affairs for certain. Yep. Any remaining questions? Oh, here's a question. This is a good one. Um, can you speak on hoarding and its relation to OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder? Are they directly linked? Yes, a component and anxiety. You know, a lot of the disorders are intertwined. You know, anxiety and depression are intermingled. You know, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder has a piece of hoarding you know one often doesn't go without the other and, and that trauma piece we often don't do things singular singularly if you are have depression or have suffered from depression or seen that with somebody then you know you know what i'm talking of uh, i i'm sort of uh I like to try and break things down in a more simple language. I mean, I could talk to you very clinically in a, in a really highfalutin kind of language, but to me, the best way to understand things is to look at a, look at a person's feelings. Uh, when I look, when I talk to my staff or when I work with someone who is in a hoarding situation and they're really angry because the county is after them to get out of their house because their house is a mess. Uh, you know, they're trying to get rid of all these papers. It's not the anger that I see. It's the sorrow that this is the stuff that's this is all they have. These papers mean something to them. You know, and when you talk to them for a while, that's the depression and it's the anxiety that someone's on their back to take away the only thing they've got left after all these years. So it's depression. It's the anxiety. And how are they going to combine that? By grabbing more, which is that compulsion to hang on. Um, so that's how I would answer your question. And that's, in essence, what the DSM-5 explains it as. Thank you. 
Um, just want to bring to everyone's attention, I did put the link in the chat to the evaluation for this presentation. Um, please complete that before we end today. I um, have another question in the uh, chat, which is, um, again, a personal organization question. For those of us who are clutterers, how do you get past freezing up when it comes to actually making the decision of what to do with an item? Well, it's the difference with cluttering. I, I think you have to ask yourself, because there's that fine line between, am I, it's like with, alcohol abuse and alcoholic. That's a fine line, cluttering, hoarding. And have I cluttered so much that it's interfering with my relationships, my relationship with myself, others, with my home and safety? You know, how long have I hung on to, uh, like I got a thing with purses, right? <laughs> so how long have I hung on to this icky old Dooney and Burke purse that I think someday might be worth something. You know, is, is it jamming up my closet space? Uh, you know, and whatever you are that you got in your cluttering issue, you, you've got to take a look at that. Is it taking up so much space? Is it getting moldy? You know, that's, you got to start asking yourself those questions. And if you feel like your clutter is getting out of control, then I would recommend talking to a social worker or therapist, somebody at Benjamin Rose, because it may be more than that, because really cluttering can be a step away from hoarding. And don't think of it as just hoarding. What's going on in your life that's making you want to hold on to something? Because again, you're not holding on to the object. You're holding on to something beyond that? Is it a loss that you're holding on to it? Is it a memory or some unresolved issue? Um, it's, it's never just the simple thing. <laughs> I've, and I'm sure all of you really know that in a way, you know, I, I, I'm not telling any of you anything you don't already know. I hope I don't come off by sounding like I'm preaching to you. We, we don't need to hear that. We've all been hurt in so many ways. Um, it's more, more than just that. So that's what I would say. Take a look at that. Or if, or if you have a loved one in your life or a good friend that can look at you and say, hey, so-and-so, you know, I, it, you're, this really isn't cluttering anymore. You know, your, your garage is a hot mess. <laughs> You don't need any more wrenches. Thank you. Um, not seeing any more questions right now. Um, we're almost to the end of our hour, so we're right on time. Again, you know, please complete that evaluation for us sometime today. Again, I'll make sure these slides are made available to you in an email after we conclude the meeting. And please uh, check our NAMI Greater Cleveland YouTube channel later in the week for the recording of today's webinar. And I'll also include the link to our YouTube channel in the follow-up email that I will send. Also, let me give you one shout out that in the fall, the Hoarding Connection always does a really great conference with different topics. Um, it'll be promoted in different vehicles. So please be on the lookout for a conference coming up. It's a minimal charge. It's uh, virtual, which I love and, and uh, has a lot of good information. So and thank you again for letting us, uh, for letting me share some information and I hope it's been of some help. Absolutely, definitely imp an important topic since we had so many folks join us today. So um, this concludes our presentation. Uh, hope you all have a great day and thank you, Tam, for uh, presenting to us today. Thank you, everybody Bye. have a good day. Thank you. Bye.